everybody, welcome to The World This Week. Terror strikes again from Canada to Jerusalem. Islamic militants attack in Egypt, killing 30 soldiers. On the Turkish-Iraqi border, the standoff continues. More cases of Ebola in the United States as New York and New Jersey move to quarantine passengers. I have to, and I am a bit scared, yes. And in Japan, Abe's government suffers one scandal after another. These are some of the issues we'll touch upon this Sunday. Our panelists, Barbara Palrom, Defense News Bureau Chief in Israel, and Dania Yalon, former Israeli ambassador to Washington and deputy foreign minister, former. Hello, Danny. Hi, Jim. Uh, Canada, Jerusalem, uh, Egypt, ISIS. Is this all the same war? Yes and no. Yes, in the fact that the ideology is, I would say, the, the, the motivating force everywhere. You see it uh, in Canada and other places, even London Tube and others, it was well-to-do Islamist, second generation. So it cannot be deprivation. Here also, it is coming out of uh, ideological and uh, very extreme Hamas ideology. But of course, you have to have other things. Here it's the national conflict with the Palestinians. Over there, it could be part of the global jihad. So I would say, by and large, it's the same, the same current, but there are different uh, versions of it. Different excuses, different places, same war. And in order to address, seriously address with some kind of a plan, the different uh, minutia of these different uh, ideologies, although they are broadly the same in terms of fanatic extremism, we really, or we at least our leaders, need to be very acutely aware of the fine differences in order to um, uh, effectively counter them, whether it's by military action in Iraq and Syria uh, or the, the economic um, boycott and seizure of their funds. Mm. Speaking of leaders, you have the Israeli uh, defense minister visiting Washington these days. Uh, he wasn't able to, to uh, even get meetings with decision makers there? So what? So what? You're not. You know, it's it, people in Israel over there got excited over this. They're making such a scandalous um, uh, hay out of this whole thing. The defense minister of Israel visited Washington. He was received by his counterpart, Chuck Hagel, at the Pentagon in an honor guard ceremony. He met with Ban Ki-moon in, ba Ki in New York, as well as Samantha Power, the U.S. Um, ambassador to the United Nations. He met with opinion leaders. He, uh, he was busy. And whoever says that as a birthright, a visiting Israeli defense minister must meet with cabinet heads. But it Jacob, seems that in Washington they leaked the fact that he was not getting these meetings. Uh, we don't know that. I mean, that's an, another Israeli spin and they're all against <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's interesting. Only Ehud Barak, really, and he was a defense minister for quite a long time, but he did institutionalize this practice of when he goes to town, the, his defense counterpart is a minor um, uh, agenda item on his whole trip. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was received by the president and the vice president and secretary of state, but that's because they viewed Ehud Barak as a sort of a, a cutout or a, a, a way to get around Bibi Netanyahu, who they do not trust. And by the way, Hillary Clinton wrote this as, as such in her, in her book. They viewed Ehud as, uh, as being a, an influence that they should try to maximize on the issue primarily of the peace process. Danny, you've been um, an ambassador to Washington. You know the game. Yes, and here I must take a different view than my good friend uh, Barbara. It's, it's okay, that's why you're here for uh, Mufaz, when he was uh, defense minister, saw everyone, including uh, uh, that time uh, Cheney as, the, as vice president and others. The fact that he did not even see the national security advisor, Susan Rice, to talk about issues which are of the utmost importance to the two countries, whether it's uh, ISIL, whether it's uh, Iran and the Palestinians, this is really a slap on the face. And uh, there is something which is very bad going on between Israel and the United States, not on the institutional um, level, but at the top level. And the top level is the window through which everybody around us examine our relations with the United States. And our relationship with the United States is a, uh, a cornerstone also of our geopolitical strength, of our deterrence capabilities. And if our enemies and even friends see uh, more than daylight between Washington and Jerusalem, they pounce in. And it could be Europeans' initiatives, which are very bad for us in the Security Council, and it would be more attacks on the ground here in the, in the Middle East. So this is why it is imperative 
for Netanyahu to leave everything and just rebuild trust and confidence between him and Obama that would trickle down to the entire system. Maybe as a little revenge, uh, Israeli Defense Minister said in an interview to the Washington Post that, uh, I don't know how he put it exactly, the Western leadership or whatever uh, is, is way wrong on the Middle East. Uh, Jacob, he was totally right. But you have to be also how smart he, how about he expressed it. it. Don't say it in a leak to the press or in some kind of briefing against the Americans. And talk do to not them. attack and uh, say, the Secretary of State and call him messianic and, 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 and talk to uh, them obsessed. one on one. Talk to them on background. You know, we have enough dialogues with the Americans to do that. There you can really shout at each other, but come together with the, eight, the same strategy, which is important to both of us. Yeah. So there was a lot of mishandling here both in Washington but also here but in Jerusalem. But both of you said that he was right. So basically, Barbara, he's right when he says that the Western leadership or maybe the United States does not, does not understand the Middle East. Listen, there is a lot of validity. Despite his manner and his uh, impolitic way of expressing his, himself, uh, the defense minister is an astute strategic analyst. Let's not forget that he spent uh, a time as um, uh, head of military intelligence here and as uh, chief of staff. He does have a very sharp analytical assessment of things. But as Danny said, uh, this, is, uh, this is what the back rooms are for. And this is what a close uh, partnership is supposed to be to air um, privately. And, and, and not go on ad hominem attacks on the U.S. Secretary of State and the U.S. President. Uh, so it, 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 in a way, it, it, I agree with Danny in that he should have seen Susan Rice. But uh, no one, uh, no Israeli defense minister needs to see other cabinet officers. No, but no, right. But, this, but Susan Rice, that was a real, yes. real slap on the face. And this was more than a signal, unfortunately. And I think it also a response to what the prime minister said on American TV that it's against American values. Ah, oh, that to was oppose. insulting. That yes. hurt, that hurt. Yeah. That really hurt, and it was under the belt, and it was not, shouldn't have done. And don't been forget done. about the lunch uh, with Sheldon Adelson <laughs> uh, the day before the <laughs> UN General Assembly uh, address. Uh, the man who personally tried to bankroll Obama's defeat uh, right. in the re-election campaign. And just all these things are, are not fitting and proper. Uh, for, uh, for uh, they're not conducive to um, more strengthened U.S. Israel relationship. Right. Next week, uh, midterm elections. Uh, predictions? Um, I th still think it's going to be a, um, a Republican Majority Senate. In the Senate. Yeah. I think it'll be a tie, but with the vice president weighing in, so it's going to be still a Republican uh, Senate, and of course the Congress will remain, the House of Representatives will remain Republican. Barbara, you, do you agree? I, I don't really have enough of an assessment on the outcome of, of the vote, but uh, I do I have heard in Washington that more gridlock is expected. Uh, that's not going to change. Two more Unfortunately. Years. Two more years. Two more years. Two more years, yes. Barbara and Danny, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Let's talk to our friend Paula Slear, Russia Today's Middle East Bureau Chief. She spent the past days covering the crisis on the Turkish-Syrian border. Hi, Paula. Thank you for joining us from Turkey. Hello, Jacob. First of all, please give us your uh, impression uh, from the ground. Well, as you can see, the battle for Kobani is continuing behind me, and that is another American airstrike. In the last half an hour, they've been happening almost every few minutes. From what we understand, the ISIS fighters are in control of around 20% of the town. Most of the fighting at this stage is focused in the east of Kobani. And according to the Syrian Kurdish fighters I've been talking to, these airstrikes are helping immensely. They say that they're managing, with the assistance of the strikes, to push the, the ISIS fighters further back. Now, we can hear more planes coming, so what we are expecting is that in the next few moments there will be further airstrikes. Now, uh, the Turks are reluctant to, to get involved and help the Kurds. Uh, how does it look from there? Well, this certainly is the sense that I'm getting talking to Syrian Kurdish fighters who are inside Turkey. Now, the reason is that they've come across the border because they're injured and they want to get medical treatment. But they tell me that if they're picked up by the Turkish army, they will be arrested. And so they're smuggling themselves out, pretending to be civilians. And now they're trying to get back into Kuba 
Kobani. They say that they have evidence that the Turkish army is assisting ISIS. And one of the flashpoints at the moment, of course, is what is going to happen with the permission that Ankara has given to the Peshmerga, who are your Iraqi Kurds. We understand at this stage, and I, I was earlier speaking with one of those Peshmerga commanders, they are still in Iraq, but they are organizing themselves. They say that around 150 of them have been given permission by Turkey to come here and assist the Syrian Kurds inside. So now, what are the people telling you there about uh, ISIS operations and behavior? Well, here in Turkey, you have around 220,000 Kobani refugees who have fled across the border. You have something like 1.8 million Syrian refugees who are currently inside Turkey. And as you drive around, you just see refugee camp after refugee camp. Talking to those refugees, they are concerned that ISIS is making advances. The ISIS fighters might be being pushed back from Kobani, but certainly Kobani is important because if ISIS is able to gain control over over Kobani. They will have control over a stretch of land all the way from Aleppo. As one refugee put it to me, if Kobani falls, well then the whole world falls. One of the other stories we are investigating is whether or not ISIS have access to chemical weapons. There have been reports that at this stage are still unconfirmed that there was at least one chemical attack on people inside Kobani. Now I was speaking with a doctor on the inside. He says that they don't have any proof of this at, at this stage. But the United States, for example, is investigating reports that ISIS in Iraq used chemical weapons against the Iraqi military. Here on the border, there are a number of Kobani refugees who each day come and literally sit on the border and watch what is happening. And earlier, people were coming up to us and asking if they could look through our camera, if they could use our zoom lens to be able to see if their homes are still standing. Certainly, the feeling on the ground is that ISIS is still very, very strong, getting a lot of support, and that this is a battle that could continue for months, if not years. Paul Slier, Russia Today's Middle East uh, Bureau Chief uh, from the Turkish-Syrian border. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Leon Klinghofer was a wheelchair-bound American Jew who was murdered by Palestinian terrorists aboard the cruise ship Achille Loro in 1985. A disabled 69-year-old passenger was shot at point blank and was thrown overboard. And now, when the Metropolitan Opera of New York decided to stage the controversial opera about it, the objection was loud and strong. And we say hello to Mrs. Nina Wiener, a longtime supporter of the Met, who strongly opposes this opera. Thank you for joining us from New York. Thank you. Now, tell me, first of all, what's so wrong with this opera? Well, the major thing is that they are trying to romanticize a group of terrorists that got on a, on a boat in uh, 1985 and killed a Jewish person that was uh, in a wheelchair. They're trying to uh, make an equivalency between terrorists and their victims. Uh, what's also very disturbing is that uh, from the beginning, a group of us felt that it was quite anti-Semitic. It was really a propaganda rather than a work, just a work of art. And it was once again attacking mostly Israel and the Jews. The first thing I asked when I wrote a letter to Peter Gelb in June, would they dare today to show an opera uh, where you show uh, Daesh or ISIS uh, uh, and the way they behead uh, Europeans and Americans and to try and understand the mentality of the people of uh, ISIS. Yeah. Well, we, we should say that the opera rejects uh, all of these uh, uh, claims. Uh, what, what about those who say that maybe th this is a, a thing of artistic freedom? No, I think that uh, it's very different. Uh, Everybody is for artistic freedom, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an excuse. It's not acceptable. Uh, does it give this opera maybe um, more attention that it really deserves? Well, I was afraid of that, but I think that yesterday particularly, the fact that it's getting some media attention, the fact that uh, Giuliani spoke very, very well, and many people spoke very well. Uh, I think we shouldn't be silent uh, in New York. 
especially in the turbulent times that we live in. Uh, you took the whole thing very personal. Uh, because you, you love opera and you've been supporting them, the Met uh, financially. Yes, absolutely. We have been going to the opera for 40 years. Um, and I'm happy to realize I'm not the only one. Uh, I have friends uh, that contribute a lot of money to the opera. And uh, I also decided not to give any more. Uh, not a dollar. I think Jews should not be silent anymore. And uh, there are too many things happening. And it's uh, just unacceptable. It's unacceptable, and we have to be heard. Nina Wiener in New York, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again. And this has been The World This Week. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week.